intersectionality in action, a conversation with the incredible Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. So get comfortable, grab something to take notes. You can also feel free to live tweet at Ed Equity Talks, and we are going to drop that link in the chat. Um, share all the gems, share all the notes, and connect with each other. The conversation is being recorded and will be made available when it's ready. We've prepared some questions to get us going, but also we invite you to submit questions through the Q&A function. We'll do our best to get to as many of them as possible in the short amount of time that we have. And thank you, thank you, thank you. So without further delay, I'm going to welcome Professor Crenshaw. Thank you so much for saying yes to this conversation. Uh, the times we are in are so critical. And I was reflecting a couple of nights ago when we landed on a date to do this, we didn't know that it would be so timely. Uh, so before we dive into questions and, and, and topics, I wanna give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the good people who are gathered here uh, today. I think I found out that you are an Ohio native, mm -hmm. you are a legal scholar, you are a teacher, you are a professor, you spend a lot of time at Columbia University and at UCLA. You're also the co-founder of the African-American Policy Forum, this awesome, think tank that brings together academics, activists, and policymakers to promote efforts to dismantle structural inequality. So that's just a little bit about what we know and what we can find out. But what do you want to tell the good people gathered here about who you are? Maybe something they might not be able to find out through a Google search. Oh, oh, that's that's a great place to start. Well, first of all, um, <laughs> Thank you so much for this invitation. And I am particularly excited to be having a conversation. It, it, it allows us to, to be more uh, organic and present in the moment, which yes. um, has, has its benefits as well as some of its challenges, particularly in this moment. What might people not know about me? Cause you did mention Ohio. Um, I am a person who loves gadgets. Um, so uh, this, this moment of, of doing all this work uh, virtually has been fun for me because I can figure out new ways to, to use all of the technology that has helped us maintain uh, the work through uh, broadening our audiences. So yes. um, our, our, our Truth Be Told campaign, our uh, Intersectionality Matters podcast, um, our Under the Black Light series, that, that has uh, been made possible by the new gadgetry around <laughs> uh, the internet. So I'm really excited uh, about that. Um, I guess the other thing is I, I'm a, uh, I really have, am a, a good eater, my friends tell me. So uh, I love putting together amazing meals, uh, going places, okay. uh, traveling around the world. If I leave a country and I haven't gotten a, a spice or a tea that <laughs> is really that country's sort of signature thing, I feel like a failure. So those are two things you might not know about that's, me that's awesome okay i'm gonna let you know next time i travel to where you are professor. okay <laughs> i'm gonna <laughs> join you there it. and just invite myself over um <laughs> don't have to invite yourself just <laughs> drop the note tell me when you're around yay thank you thank you so for the audience we have i think we had about 700 plus maybe 800 people registered for this webinar we are not going to go into all the details of what critical race theory and intersectionality um, are. And we are instead going to share some resources in the chat so people have time to dive into those concepts for themselves if they need to. But for the purpose of our conversation today, I want to lift up a quote taken straight from the African-American Policy Forum website that I felt captures the essence of these concepts and theories really, really well. Um, and when I was reviewing 
that passage, it really talked about how for so long we've had this narrow conceptualization of racial inequality. And I'm going to read the quote, so I don't, I, I don't like misquoting things. So critical race theory and intersectionality have produced wide range bodies of knowledge to uncover how racial domination is produced, naturalized and contested within the law, which we often forget, public policy and a wide variety of institutional and social locations. And then he goes on to say, critical race theory and intersectionality have also modeled modes of collaboration, exchange and collective analysis that stand in sharp contrast to the individuated understandings of social inequality that rule most disciplines and institutions today. And I will argue that public education and the sector of philanthropy are two of those disciplines and institutions um, that are governed by social inequality. So basically the way I interpret that is that critical race theory and intersectionality provide us with the frameworks, the theories and the critical tools that we need to be able to reckon with racism to understand and analyze the ways in which inequality is reproduced in various forms so that we can indeed imagine and realize the dismantling of oppressive systems and structures. Mm -hmm. That's the work that we try and strive to do at Nelly May. And that's the work that many of the organizations and school systems that we support purport to do. Would you like to add anything to how we should understand um, critical race theory and intersectionality? Oh, yes, yes. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for lifting up that quote. I, I guess maybe what might be helpful, I mean, because that's sort of the uh, conclusion of a journey, right? Mm -hmm. Of understanding the arenas in which racial power um, has, has functioned and how those arenas shape racial disparity outside of uh, philanthropy and education. Um, so, so maybe just a, a little bit of historicizing, I, I, I'll put my, my own trajectory inside of that um, yes, uh, awareness, that awakening around um, how racial justice uh, uh, is situated in those spaces. So um, I consider myself a, a child of the civil rights movement. I'm at the tail end of the baby boom generation. During the time in which I was actually on this planet, uh, we moved from a society that was formally and normatively organized around the idea of white supremacy to a society that has formally repudiated um, the, the idea of white supremacy, and yet institutionally is still grappling with what that repudiation actually looks like, like materially inside mm -hmm. of our institutions. So in a sense, if, if you think about racial justice as a relay race that each generation sort of runs around the track and passes the baton on to the next, I consider myself that generation that was passed the baton of all right, we have um, fought for and uh, achieved the breaking down of the white only signs. Now you are in these institutions. Your turn is to run the race and uh, light the way as to where and how the commitment to dismantle uh, discrimination and segregation and white supremacy actually takes place inside the institutions. So we did the sit-ins outside. You guys are in there. Now what is it that you see mm -hmm. that needs to be attended to? Um, and that, you know, basically comes from having uh, seen uh, the civil rights movement play out in front of our eyes, see the um, how hard fought some of these uh, door openings uh, were um, understanding the role of lawyers and mm -hmm. educators in particular uh, in in uh, opening up the pathways and 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 frankly seeing in my own household Thurgood Marshall was uh, you know the first Supreme Court justice the man that argued Brown versus Board of Education. 
he was a hero in the same way Martin Luther King was. Mm -hmm. um, in my home, opening up education uh, and, and the power of knowledge production was as important as the ability to vote. Mm -hmm. um, so recognizing that the, the, that the torch had to move into these other spaces was, was almost, you know, I, I learned that on the knee of my parents, mm -hmm. but learning it and doing it are two really two different, different things. things. Oh my so goodness. Um, the, the, the short thing that I'll say on that is that um, I think sometimes we, and by that, I mean, educators um, aren't uh, seen as being on the front lines in the same ways that those who were demanding the end of police brutality or the end of vote suppression are seen. But in reality, the struggle over the production of knowledge, what counts as knowledge, who can be the subjects of knowledge, um, to what degree does dismantling the past require us to dismantle the knowledge production uh, uh, processes in order to open up these spaces to people for whom the space was not initially constructed. Those are cutting edge questions. Yes. And now that we're in this moment when there's so much pushback on the knowledge that did get produced, I mean, yeah, we got into these colleges and universities, but what was really important is what came out of our entry. So we got, you know, ethnic studies and, and black studies, we got feminist studies, we got queer studies, we got critical race theory. This is what came out of integrating these institutions and then allowing those students and participants to say, is not enough to let us in. Now we have to think about how to rethink what these institutions do. For so long, they've helped facilitate exclusion. They've naturalized oppression. Now that we're here, the, the mission should be, how do we correct for those things that knowledge produce, producing as educational institutions help to create? And how do we open up these pathways for greater inclusion across society? That's what we were able to do, I think, in the last couple of decades. And that's where the source of so much um, backlash, I think that's why so much of the backlash is taking place around education. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You are giving us an education and thank you for taking us back um, to that journey. I, I believe in the, the concept of Sankofa and understanding mm. who we are oh, and where we've you been and from, from which we came in order to make meaning of the present and 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 inform the future. Thank you for that. So powerful. And you just went straight to my second question, right? Which is really this moment we are in. And the powerful questions that you are putting on the table now are speaking to the resistance and the fear to the rethinking, the reimagining, uh, the dismantling, right? That you just named. And across the country, we are seeing all kinds of things. I can't open my social media page without seeing something about critical race theory and a new definition of critical race theory every day, all day long. And we're seeing these dangerous attacks on racial justice, right? We are seeing conservatives and members of the right who are taking the terminology and weaponizing it as a, as a catch-all term for any conversation about race, racism, wokeness, right? Like basically we, we shouldn't teach the truth. We shouldn't teach history at all. Uh, we shouldn't teach children and young people to consume and, and critique information. But like you and I were talking about yesterday, this is not just a Southern or conservative phenomenon, right? Even in so-called liberal progressive New England. We are seeing bills in state legislature um, in New Hampshire and Rhode Island that seek to ban the teaching of race, structural racism and, and, and the use of critical race theory as a, as a frame. Um, people wanna know, how are you making meaning? I mean, you've given us a little bit already in your last um, response, but how are you making meaning of what's happening um, in the landscape or and across the country? And do you have specific messages for mm -hmm. educators, young people, um, and policymakers who find themselves in the midst of this? 
Yeah. Well, th- thank you for that. And, you know, I, I, I want to uh, specifically thank you for framing the question, what do we make of the attack? Because in fact, so many um, of the questions that we've received have in some ways participated in the attack by asking, so what is it about this critical race theory that is, you know, it has set so many uh, uh, people on edge rather than what is it about the attack that has contributed to uh, institutions that traditionally support the idea of the free expression of ideas and, and intellectual inquiry to at least not oppose this and in some ways uh, participate in it. Um, and so I start there. I start with historicizing what these kind of attacks are about, why we've seen this before and, and why um, it's such a, a puzzle that it's taken so long for people to actually uh, comprehend what is really happening. So um, two things just for starts, let, starters, let's remember that the control of the frame, the control of the uh, ability to communicate, the control over uh, knowledge about racial oppression has always been one of the go-to features of those who want to sustain and maintain an inequitable status quo. So let's just remember, for example, um, that uh, abolitionist literature uh, over a century uh, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and a half ago uh, was by was in many states criminalizable. It was punishable. Let's remember that uh, Southern states were fairly powerful in our, our national uh, 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 Congress, and they were able to mobilize federal law to make it difficult, if not impossible, uh, to uh, share literature that ran counter to the lies that were told about enslavement and about enslaved people. Let's also remember that the slaves themselves, enslaved people themselves, uh, were uh, uh, not permitted to even read. Mm -hmm. What is it about Uh, suppressing uh, the capacity to think and to read and to debate uh, uh, the conditions under which uh, African people lived under. What is it about that moment that we can read into this one? Mm -hmm. So number one, we should remember um, that uh, liberationist ideas and and research and, and even the capacity to think about the condition has always been framed by those who want to support the status quo um, as uh, as divisive, um, as as um, uh, perverse, mm-hmm. and even as un-American. So, in one way, we just have to put a historical lens on to say, you know, like Malcolm X was often known as saying, you know, racism comes up with a new model every year. Well, the repression. Uh, of discourse about freedom is packaged in a new way every year. And, and, and now the anti-anti-racism is the package of the moment. I think we also should realize that there's specific um, substantive moves that have always been part of the effort to push back on uh, those uh, and in those moments in which anti-racism has come to the fore. In, in our own life, in my own lifetime, the civil rights movement was framed as, um, as reverse discrimination against uh, white people who did not want to sit beside uh, black people in, um, in, in public accommodations against waiters and, and store owners who would say, well, forcing me to serve uh, people of color is violating my civil rights. This is discrimination against me. I mean, even at the end of the civil war, our own Supreme Court said that uh, race, uh, um, uh, race-based civil rights uh, laws were reverse discrimination. It took away from white people to give to the freedmen. So the ability to turn anti-racism on its head, mm-hmm. the ability to generate uh, resentment and insecurity among those who feel that 
uh, the, that maintaining the status quo is a zero sum game. Uh, namely, um, white folks who have opposed uh, these moments throughout history, the ability to frame it as mm -hmm. reverse discrimination is, 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 is uh, that's as American as, as apple pie. Yes. So I think, you know, giving people a prism so that they can read this moment through the lens of um, there's almost never anything new. new. Mm -hmm. It gets repackaged. And so now the package is critical race theory, um, which, you know, if you actually ask people, what is it, you'll get a million different responses and almost none of it will reflect any significant effort to respond directly to the ideas. What it is, is a making up of ideas like critical race theory says all white people, you know, are morally, you know, um, uh, compromised people or uh, critical race theory sows hatred and resentment to the United States. They will make that stuff up. They won't be able to point to exactly. any, any writing in, in among critical race theorists that says that. Um, so we also have to remember that um, that distortion is part of misinformation. And when you ask then, is Lane, what do we, what should we suggest that parents and teachers do? I think parents and teachers, number one, should should ask a question, which I can I call consider the source. Mm -hmm. um, many of these foundations and uh, legal defense funds and spokespersons are people who would who would want to convince you that the election was stolen. Mm -hmm. They'd want to convince you that the attack on the Capitol was just tourists taking a look around to to see you know the seat of government. They. Um, are those who want to convince you that there is no such thing as climate change. They want to convince you that the Civil War was a war of Northern aggression. I mean, look at all of the things that are part of this panoply of ideas um, that are meant to advance a particular sense of uh, grievance and a particular way of thinking about defending the Republic through aggressive uh, truly uh, un-American ideas and understand that if they're going to tell you a lie about all the things that you know are not true, then they're also going to tell you a lie about what's happening in schools, a lie about what is anti-racism and a lie about what's good for our country. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. And the question that um, you're bringing up for me is, why are they so good at it? Right? Like we've, been, we've been talking about this notion of like organized demand, right? Like it's not just demand, like how do we organize and how do we organize very intentionally because power and white supremacy will never concede, right? Um, why are they so good at it? Yeah, yeah. My my uh, co-founder, Luke Harris has just a, a quip that he says all the time. It's like, well, for the other side, is like rolling a ball down a hill. Um, the hill is already there. Mm -hmm. um, it is a hill that is naturalized um, and built on top of a history of specific kinds of policies, mm -hmm. practices, and, and, and cultural understandings of racial inequality that many people just see as just there. Mm -hmm. And interrupting that is, is, is like going against gravity. It is mm -hmm. you know, actually trying to create uh, dams and uh, interventions that take the built-in dimensions of power and redirect it. So mm -hmm. um, uh, civil rights legislation is always gonna stand out as disruptive because we take as a given uh, the way our institutions function without those interruptions, right? So uh, that, that's why President Johnson in, in 1866 said, giving African-Americans civil rights is reverse discrimination. Why? Because the baseline, the, the existing system of who gets what and how um, uh, opportunity is distributed, that was taken as neutral, natural, and just there. Mm -hmm. And the interruptions are seen as, well, that's the change. That's the, that's the thing that's going against the grain. Mm -hmm. And that going against the grain is what anti-racism is about. That's saying, um, you know, it's not just colorblindness, 
uh, that uh, people were marching for. It's not just colorblindness that Linda Brown's parents were suing um, to, to disrupt. It was the actual uh, unequal substantive message and reality that segregation produced, which was unequal educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. So however those unequal opportunities are created, whether through explicit race categorization or from allowing patterns of segregation to decide which groups are best served and which groups are not by education, those are all problems of the history of racial segregation and white supremacy um, in our country. So it's harder to um, uh, allow people to read the social <laughs> landscape than it is for them to uh, see it as just there uh, and, and be willing to go along with it. So it is easier uh, for the side that's defending an unequitable status quo to say to people, you worked hard for everything mm -hmm. you got. Yeah. Your grandfather came here with nothing. And now you're, you're pretty uh, well positioned. Our country works. Well, of course, people, um, it's easier to do that when you haven't really told them all of the ways that it didn't work for people who were locked out yeah. of receiving $120 billion of housing support, that were locked out uh, of, uh, of traditionally white universities and colleges, were wiped out uh, and locked out from professional classes and even wiped out uh, from being firemen and policemen until well into the 70s and late 80s. So you got to be able to um, have an archaeological approach to the ground on mm -hmm. which we stand. Mm -hmm. Critical race theory, anti-racism, structural racism, these are archaeological tools that allow us to look underneath the foundations of, of current society and say, hey, there's a story here. It's harder to tell. But when people are told it, like we saw last summer, mm -hmm. people are willing to say, oh, why, this, this is not consistent with our deeper values. I am going to join a, a protest. I am going to recommit to the ideals of, uh, uh, of our constitution. And that activation, that recognition that millions of people all over the country can be activated and motivated to demand better of our society, that is the crux of the backlash. And it's now time to roll out all of the old tropes and mobilize that insecurity and resentment against this thing that they are calling um, critical race critical theory. theory. <laughs> this, I like that, this thing that they're calling critical race theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a million questions. We have some coming through uh, the q and I'm gonna try to marry some of them. Okay. Um, and one question, I think folks are hungry for, for uh, perhaps some concrete uh, suggestions, right? And there is a set of questions around, okay, how do we help, I'm going to frame it as folks who are making decisions on, be, on, on behalf of our young people and, and communities, right? So thinking about education commissioners, um, thinking about school boards, thinking about administrators. Mm -hmm. How do we support them in standing strong to teach our students the reality of America's history of racial oppression? Is protest, yeah. our, best, is, is protest our best tool um, yeah. to, to get there? Well, let's, let, let us historicize this question as well. Um, protest is, is, is not the only tool, let's, let's put it that way. And let's also recognize that without protest, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, historically, th there, there hasn't been uh, a real robust effort to have the difficult conversations that we need to have. In all of our institutions, I would say in philanthropy as, as well as education. Um, so we are fully aware 
that uh, progress, transformative, transformative interventions happen um, when they're, I, I've called it sort of frame alignment uh, with mm -hmm. basically folks from uh, the White House uh, all, all the way down you know, to the outhouse are basically seeing a problem similarly. There's never gonna be complete and total congruence, mm -hmm. but often there is enough congruence so that pipelines of power are available to move from the experience say of you know sitting on the back of the bus all the way up to the supreme court saying the imposition of this uh, rule is itself a violation of the equal protection clause. So when when I think about what is it that we need on the side of greater capacity to read the conditions of inequality in ways that open up uh, uh, tools to address it, when I when I ask myself that, I think what we really need is to engage in uh, sort of uh, activities that allow us to see um, where the problems still exist, that allow us to go beyond the tropes of, well, I don't think of, of you as, as of color or, or beyond the tropes of colorblindness to see what colorblindness is actually cloaking, mm -hmm. um, to, to ask the questions about where is um, racial disempowerment playing a role here um, in, in, in ways that amplify what it used to do, but just without the pronouncement anymore. What can we do uh, mm -hmm. to, to be more present and to have the capacity um, to deliver the energies uh, that we saw last year into, okay, now this institution is under the black light. Where, where do we need to uh, place our energies? Um, so I think uh, willingness to continue to ask the questions, willingness to continue to uh, find ways of uh, aligning what we're seeing to uh, what we're doing. Um, and also, you know, always remember that the, 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 the battle over how we conceptualize is, is probably the, the most important battle. Because if mm -hmm. you can't name social problems for what they are, um, if you can't defend the tools that allow you to measure the social problem, if you can't defend the demands of those who are on the other side locked out because of the barrier, if you can't lift up their voices, then you are unable to solve the problem. So all along you know, this trajectory, do we have the right voices at the table? Are we, um, uh, uh, are we using prisms that allow us to see what the uh, obstacles and barriers are? Are we historicizing the inequality so we're not seeing them as existing in the bodies of the people who are underrepresented, but in existing in our practices that we've not really changed this significantly yes. um, to facilitate the, the inclusion of these people? And, and lastly, you know, philanthropy. Philanthropy has played a significant role in determining uh, what conceptualizations of racial inequality will be centered and which ones are going to be marginalized. Mm -hmm. And structural racism is one of those ideas that was not traditionally centered in philanthropy. Now we're starting to have that conversation and it's important for philanthropy to play a role in protecting this conversation so we're able to experience all the insights that it will deliver to us. Whew, thank you. And for my funder colleagues who are listening, uh, I look forward to us continuing this conversation. How do we protect this conversation so that the work can continue to happen. Um, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna pivot just a little bit because I don't think we can talk about your work and talk about critical race theory and intersectionality without uplifting black girls and women. And in, in one of your written pieces, it wasn't that long ago and it was right after uh, the Chauvin's verdict on the murder of George Floyd and the police killing of Makia Bryan. Mm -hmm. uh, you wrote a piece a, in which you pose a set of really powerful questions, right? I'm gonna read them for us. When will the trauma, the pain and the disregard of black girls ever rise to the top of our agenda? 
to enhance their well-being psychologically, physically, and spiritually? When will we as a society answer the call to become our sister's keepers? I lift those questions up. I thank you for them. I lift them up uh, because looking at our schools, we know that Black girls are disciplined at much higher rates mm -hmm. than their white peers for similar infractions. And we know you and, and colleagues at AAPF are doing some incredible work on behalf of our people. Can you tell us just a little bit about your work with AAPF's mm. Black Girls Matter initiative? Yes, thank you so much for asking that. You know, um, this, this work with, with, black, with black girls is really, uh, uh, the, I think the trajectory of it tells us a lot about uh, actually the role of foundations in, in setting agendas and um, excluding certain uh, dimensions of, of racial inequity from the framing of the problem in the first place. Um, uh, some of this work started over a, a decade ago um, with uh, Leticia, uh, Latifa Simon and, and Priscilla O'Chen, who at the time were uh, at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And we were all talking about how the increasing focus Focus on the school to prison pipeline and criminalization more broadly as the new Jim Crow was missing a gendered component to it. Uh, people were talking about it as though um, this criminalization, this school to prison pipeline was exclusively uh, a boy problem. Um, and because it was framed as a boy problem, the efforts to uh, collect information about it, to develop policy interventions based on it, to give people uh, information to have the talk with their daughters, all of that stuff was uh, unavailable. It was such a uh, there was such a silencing about it that when we started bringing people together to talk about girls and, and women, there was a sense that it was almost an illegitimate conversation. We mm. even called it a speakeasy. Like here, here's the, the secret code to get into this conversation because people didn't want to be read as not supporting uh, boys and, and consequently men. They didn't want to mm. be seen as being not down for anti-racism to actually say, well, how is... Uh, anti-black racism in the schools impacting, you know, our girls. So uh, we uh, decided, you know what, we really need to talk about this. So, so we had a, a conference on uh, being over-policed and under-protected, mm -hmm. which we talked about how the entire criminalization project actually was gendered in ways that we didn't appreciate. And then we decided, let's do, let's do more. Let's look at what's happening to girls, you mm -hmm. know, in these zero tolerance schools. And, and shockingly, we actually found, as you pointed out, that the racial disparity between, you know, cohorts of girls was actually greater for black girls than it was for black boys. By that, I mean the relationship between the risk of being suspended mm -hmm. and expelled uh, for, for girls who were black was far greater um, than for boys who were black relative to their same gender opposite race cohort. And that was like, wow, why do people not talk about this? Um, to the extent that this is a problem uh, that should be seen as racism, mm -hmm. it is a particular kind of racism about uh, black girls to the extent that that um, reality was not part of the agendas in the early uh, two, 2000s is a product of intersectional erasure. Mm -hmm. The specific ways that black girls experience racial discrimination exists structurally are encoded in the, the zero tolerance policies but politically erased in anti-Black racism and also um, in gender-based discourses. So our, our, our goal was at least to speak into that silence. We might not be able to fully carry the demand to create interventions, but we certainly could say, we're not gonna participate in the silencing and the erasure about the ways that Black girls are being treated in the schools. So yeah. that's, where, um, that's where Black Girls Matter came. Um, and, and frankly, now I think there is far more attention, far more research, um, but still the implications of that erasure go across our entire uh, uh, sort of trajectory of anti-Black uh, anti racism work. Absolutely. And 
you've done enough work that so many of us have paid attention. And, and earlier, um, one piece of advice you, 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 you gave us is there's never going to be complete congruence, right? But the work that you've done has generated enough interest, enough demand that we can't afford to look away moving forward. And I think, you know, for folks who are asking some of the questions I'm looking at, you've just articulated why it is important that our approach or the approach to the work of racial justice happens through the centering and experiences and needs of black girls who are at the margin. Because if we can figure some of that out, we can help everyone else along the way. Um, thank, thank you for that. So folks want to know, and I just got a note that we have about five minutes left. I want more time. So you may need to come back, Professor Crenshaw. You might need to come back. So I'm going to um, once again merge just a couple of questions. Some folks want to know what sustains you in this struggle, right? Like, how are you doing? You know, because people know you and it's, it's easy to attack who you are as a, as a human in the world and based on all of the work, the body of work that you've done, it's easy to target, right? So how are you doing? How are you sustaining yourself in the struggle? And I personally wanna know how you maintain hope, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Cause I, if I were you, I might be really angry. How, how, how mm -hmm. do you sustain your sense of hope? Um, and then to close, what are you dreaming about these days? <laughs> oh, that last one is, is funny. I, I have very vivid dreams. <laughs> um, so I, I guess the, the, how am I doing? You know, I, I, I go back and forth between, you know, when I, when I was growing up, if you got into, you know, some words with somebody, the first thing you would do is say, <laughs> hold up, hold up. You know, <laughs> let me take out my earrings and, and we're about to get with it. So there are times <laughs> you know, that I see things. So I was like, where did that come from? So I have my mm -hmm. hold up, I'm going to, you know, get into it. But then I, I realized, you know what, this is partly what the point is. The partly the point is to distract us from the work that we are doing by just throwing any and every old thing, you know, over, over our way. Um, when in, in fact, what's far more important is to continue to produce the information and the frames and the tools that are necessary to dismantle uh, uh, some of the toxicity that has been uh, uh, built into our institutions and that just sit there, you know, in, 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 the, in, the, in the spaces creating uh, these, these uh, diseased outcomes. So, you know, I, I frequently say that, uh, you know, if, 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 if racism were a social problem that we cared about as much as we cared about asbestos, for example, um, we would realize how crazy it is to say, well, you know, the solution to brown lung disease is not to talk about asbestos anymore, um, not to create the tools to see asbestos, certainly uh, not to remove it from our institutions because removing it from our institutions actually damages it. Like what? Good. People would never it's say no that. It would make no sense whatsoever. And yet now we find ourselves having to defend the need to sustain the tools that have been necessary to identify all the ways that racial exclusion, I ideas that were grounded in white supremacy are embedded in the spaces that we have to work, live, vote, exist. So um, I think, I think, remembering that yes. um, is, is, is uh, helpful to me. Um, the fact that there are so many people who see this for what it is and are beginning to become even more activated, um, I think is, is, is really key. But I, I, when you say what gives me hope, um, uh, I, I think about how further along we are in this cycle this, you know, race reform and retrenchment was the first thing I ever wrote. You know, when there is racism and there's reform, there's almost always retrenchment to mm. that reform. So realizing that we are in another cycle of this and we've had several, that's that's a piece of it that is calming. Now, I think the idea that it's naturally going to work out or time is going to resolve it 
I don't believe that. I believe that we continue to have opportunities to deepen the aspiration to create a society that's worthy of the celebration that we symbolically want to bestow upon it. Mm -hmm. So this is another opportunity to push back against the retrenchment, deepen our commitments to what kind of society we want. Do we want to have one in which we just don't talk about racism or do we want to have one in which we are grappling with the contemporary consequences of it and materially changing um, our practices so we're able to reach that moment. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in a different, um, uh, we're differently situated than we were say when uh, Thurgood Marshall was trying to imagine a society in, in which the Supreme Court sided with the excluded rather than the Supreme Court as it most often did sided with the most powerful. He couldn't have imagined, you know, that it, it was, it actually could ha happen um, or perhaps not see what it would look like, but that didn't mean that he did not step out you know, on, on faith that doing something uh, towards that end was far better than acquiescing mm -hmm. to the terms of black life as they were, you know, given to us. So I just think about, you know, um, those who passed the baton on to us, it was a smaller baton. Mm -hmm. uh, it was harder to carry, uh, but they did their job in making sure that there was something to pass on. Mm -hmm. And I see our generation as um, this is a moment where we have to stand firm and tall and strong that we are not gonna let uh, the other side uh, uh, shift their tactics, which at one point were, no, you don't deserve to be here to, no, we're not gonna talk about the terms upon which you are here. Yeah. Um, because mm -hmm. for you to do that is discrimination against me. We have to be that generation that says, no, that's not gonna go down anymore. And we are preserving this framework and these ideas. So our young people have an understanding of the world that they have inherited to better transform it mm. for their future generation. That's amazing. Is that what you're dreaming about? Oh my goodness. So I, <laughs> I have all sorts of dreams uh, and, and funny uh, times like these are, are, are moments when they're actually you know, coming, coming, coming. So I have dreams about what the awakening inside the awakening looks like, mm -hmm. you know, um, people not only, you know, uh, marching in, in protest, but people marching for things, people uh, taking these, the energy that we saw all across the country and taking it into schools and into school board meetings and um, into, into their workplaces and into their places of worship into the beauty shop and the and and the barber shop um th this activation not being seen as just about one death or um the realization of its goals not just the conviction of one person but of an understanding that while prejudice and 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 explicit uh racial antipathy is one modality of uh, racial power, it is not the only one. It is, it, there are more ways that, that we are attending to from implicit bias uh, to uh, assuming that the way we distribute opportunity is race neutral when it isn't. Mm -hmm. There are more questions that people are asking. There are more tools to help them ask it. As long as there's the energy and the commitment to take those those answers and to galvanize it into energies for uh, transformative justice. I think we're at that moment where people are, are ready and prepared and we need to make those frames and the opportunity come into congruence with each other. The way that the, uh, the other side has, has, has successfully done that. Yes, thank you. I think that is a good closing word. And I thank you so much. You've given and continue to offer us so much, including in this very packed conversation and words can't properly convey my gratitude, our gratitude. So we, we give you all the flowers, Professor Crenshaw, all of them. Yeah. And for the audience, wherever you are, I hope you are snapping. Thank you for joining us. 
We hope that this discussion was enlightening and inspiring. And for me, it felt like a, a clarion call for all of us to continue to, to get in, in good and necessary trouble. And I'm holding on to the, what kind of society do we want to create and imagine for ourselves and future generations? And I'm holding on to, you know, thinking about what my role is in, in that work, right? Like with the baton that I've been passed. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you audience. Go forth and think about what you've learned here, what you've been reminded of, and ways in which you hope to continue to make change within your own sphere of influence. Um, so we can take further steps towards racial justice. Thank you, thank you.